The Remedial Herstory Project is a nonprofit working to get women's history into the primary and secondary history curriculum. To help us meet our goal, we produce media, lesson plans, and so much more. You can check it out on our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Our project is funded through grants and by patrons, potentially like you. Thank you to our patrons, Jeff, Barbara, Christian, Ken, Jamie, Jenna, Nancy, Megan, Leah, Mark, Nicole, Anne, Sarah, Alicia, Katia, Michelle, Jessica, Laura, and Jackie. If you would like to join these wonderful people and become a patron, you can head over to patreon.com and become a supporter of the Remedial Herstory Project. You too can help us reform education and allow women to be seen, heard, and complicated. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell them what's happening in today's episode? In this episode, we are going to be talking about criminal women in the colonial era of U.S. history. Deal. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50% the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. In this episode, we're asking the question, what crimes were women typically accused of in the 17th and 18th century? And we are joined on this episode by Dr. Shannon Duffy. All right. So, She is a legal historian and got to look at history. And this is a weird, you know, whenever you're investigating history, you have to do it through documents. And legal documents are an interesting way of examining. Oh, sure. It's a nice way in. Yeah. And it's a nice way where women are all over, just, you know, sort of equally all over the the written record. Wait, so is this the era where there were all witches and then there was... (laughs) (laughs) So we do talk Scandal. about we do talk about witchcraft and which obviously was a crime women were accused what? of. No, um but we also talk about things like infanticide. Um oh, women yeah. women were accused of being homosexual. Uh women were accused of murder. And so there are lots of ways in which women come into sort of this this lens of looking at history and um the way you know the law treated them um and the yeah. types of things that they're being accused of are just really interesting and it gives us a lot of insights into um the way women were treated or thought of or compared yeah and and what their lives were like you know because obviously when it makes it to court these are extreme examples oh sure Um, But looking at those extremes can really help you maybe understand a little bit what Mm. what women on those extremes were dealing with and and yeah and what they went through and how they survived. Yeah, so I'm so excited to have Dr. Shannon Duffy here, and let's have her introduce herself. So my name is Shannon Duffy. Uh, I am a senior lecturer at Texas State University, which is in San Marcos, Texas. Uh, I actually teach on early American history, so colonial, uh, revolutionary, early national, uh, but I also do constitutional and legal history. And so specifically, uh, I do a class called Witches, Whores, Murderers, and Thieves, uh, uh, which is basically about capital crime in early America. Yeah, it used to be called Courts and Society in Early America. My enrollment went up when I changed the name. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine why. That's an amazing title. (laughs) So how did you get into um, legal history? That's such a fascinating field. How did and how did you get into women in that field? That's well, I I can't say that I actually do women specifically, but, you know, at the college level, we do know they're they're half the human race. And so they do show (laughs) up. Uh, they, they, They sort of naturally show up in the records, although certainly when I went looking after I got your call, uh, there's certainly a lot more work to be done. Uh, But uh, the thing about legal history, it's actually new legal history. It's sort of the older way of doing, at least within early American history, legal history was sort of to look at the legal records. Uh, And, and, you know, just sort of what do the legal records say? And it actually gives you a really warped, first of all, it's really boring. Uh, But secondly, you know, what the records say is not how the society works. What is really, so sort of pluses and minuses of legal history and specifically micro histories, which is sort of when you can sort of take one court case 
Uh, one really good one is Anne Orthwood's Bastard, which I can talk about a little bit later. Uh, but basically, you can take one court case and all the records and try to reconstruct the whole world. Like Natalie Zaman Davis's The Return of Martin Gare is kind of the first micro history. She has this case in France in the Hundred Years' War, and she uses it not to about the case, but really to sort of reconstruct the whole world. Um, what is cool about legal history is ordinary people show up in a way that they don't in a lot of other places, including women, uh, you know, and uh, because early American history is they, their idea of the law is holistic, meaning, you know, if you are accused of theft, people are going to testify as to whether you are a good wife uh, or whether you are an adulterer or, you know, what are your religious beliefs? A lot of details of everyday life shows up often in the court records. That's the plus. The minus is, of course, it's not a completely comprehensive view of the world because it is the people on the margins. It is the people who've got who've run afoul. Um, so you always have to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, but it definitely, you know, it is a place in which you can find people talking bluntly uh, about things like sexuality that they don't talk about in a lot of other places. Yeah, I, I've taught this class for a while. The other way that I felt like I kind of might be useful to you uh, is that I've written a number of articles, sort of short articles uh, for several sort of online databases. Uh, one of them is the world of the American Revolution uh, on sort of topics that are on the intersection of sexuality and legal history. So contraception, abortion, infanticide, homosexuality, cross-dressing, bundling, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, and again, you know, it's it's sexuality in early America as a field is something that really has only gotten a lot of sort of academic attention for like about the last 30 years. Same sex sexuality, even less so. So tell me about some of the early records in colonial history that touch on these themes. What, okay. what do you know about people in that time? Okay, so you want I can start with when do women like get in trouble, like felony level? Uh, with the law. Uh, so if he wanted to guess what is the number one crime that a woman, what do you think? What, what do you think? The number one crime a woman's likely to get hanged for in like 17th century. This is pretty much true everywhere, New England as well as the South. Well, so I, I being a New Englander, I know <laughs> about, I know about like Mary Dyer, who was mm. a Quaker, who was yep. hung for being a Quaker, but um, but I I would have guessed adultery if I didn't know about Mary Dyer's story. Okay, so first of all, funny, I just found out about Mary Dyer, and of course <laughs> they, they hanged for for you know, I mean, I, I found something specific about her, uh, which is that I always assumed she was hanged for blasphemy, but she was actually hanged for sedition. Uh, because the, the New Englanders, Puritans that they are, they still believe in a big separation of church and state. She you know, gets in trouble with the church and she gets thrown out of the church for blasphemy. But she's a threat to the state because she's telling them they're ungodly. And because the state is run along, the elect is running the state. If they're ungodly, she's challenging the state. But it is neither. It's not adultery, although adultery is something that, that is probably on the dockets. It is where women are going to be showing up. It's a huge fornication and adultery, and there is a difference. Uh, most of them are going to get whipped. Whipping is sort of your go-to, because, of course, early America does not have jails. Uh, so you're going to be talking about fines and corporal punishment, banishment, and death. Uh, sort of what they have to work with. No jails really in the night. Well, but you don't have, you know, they, and also a lot of the folk, especially up in New England, has to do with uh, reintegrating people into society. Uh, even the people who are dying, because, you know, you still, you can have them confess on the gallows and then sort of their soul has, you know, been forgiven, even if they're still going to die. Um, but uh, it, so the number one crime that, he, that women are going to get hanged for is infanticide. Uh, it is, and that is a standard all the way through 17th, really through the, it, it, it dwindles the number of people who are executed for infanticide uh, by the 18th century, but you still have executions for infanticide through the period of the revolution. One of the last ones, which actually helped end it, uh, there was a case, uh, I want to say it's either Pennsylvania or Massachusetts, uh, right about the constitutional period, like 1786. By this point, women aren't getting executed for infanticide unless it's really egregious. And this was a pair of twins who'd been stomped to death. And uh, she didn't, she wouldn't say what happened. I mean, they're dead bodies of twins. She wouldn't say until after she was convicted. And then she admitted that her husband, or her, sorry, her lover, it's all, infanticide is always single women. It's always illegitimate children. Her lover basically held her at gunpoint 
and stomped the babies in the woods. And she could, she was helpless. She had to watch. Uh, and she wouldn't say that. And she was pardoned, pardoned didn't come in time. Like the, literally the rider got there right as she was being hanged. And they actually tried to resuscitate her, pulled her down from the gals, tried to resuscitate her. We're not successful. This is actually a case that was responsible for them getting rid of the capital penalty uh, for infanticide because by the 18th century, uh, women, you know, there's a change in how women are seen. In the 17th century, the sort of the older is that, you know, women are, you know, more likely to be evil, lusty, uh, weaker. Uh, by the 18th century, this, this, the feeling is more sort of women are fragile. They need to be protected. Uh, you know, if they've been led astray, it's usually by a seducer. Uh, it's sort of, sort of more of an enlightenment view, uh, much more sympathetic. And so, you know, that's, so infanticide is the number one. And I think one of the things Red said something like four out of every 10 homicide cases are for infanticide. The laws on infanticide uh, come from basically King James. Yeah, first of all, it is something that is very specifically class-based. Uh, married women are never, you know, unless their husbands are away. Uh, it, it's, it's basically, it's, it's single women who are hel- having illegitimate babies. It's impossible in this time period to tell whether the baby is born alive. And so the standard is if you did, if you tried to conceal your pregnancy, if you didn't tell anyone about your pregnancy, then the assumption, the burden of proof is actually on the mother to show that she either prepared baby clothes or she told one person about her pregnancy. Uh, other than that, they're actually going to, you know, if they find evidence that the baby was born dead, you know, that was the baby's dead, that she could hang for infanticide because of concealment. That's actually an English standard that come over. Um, so, yeah. And then beyond that, of course, witchcraft. Uh, it's a very specific uh, time period, uh, but as you, I'm sure you know, witchcraft is very, very gendered. Um, it's actually more gendered over in Europe than it is in colonial America. Something like 90% of all the people accused of witchcraft in Europe. And of course, they had tens of thousands of cases over like a 300 year period. Uh, so like 90% of them are women. Uh, our numbers are actually more equitable. It's like three fourths. Uh, but if you look at the men, they're almost always connected to women. Uh, witchcraft is a social activity. It's it's sort of like one of those um, what they call those the, the, the multi level marketing schemes. Uh, you know, if if the devil pulls you in as a witch, you are expected to go out and find more witches. Uh, and so, of course, the first people you're going to talk to are your sisters, your daughters, maybe your husband, uh, your close friends. Uh, and so, if somebody is accused of being a witch. Those are the people who are most vulnerable. But that's how you end up with a lot of the men in the witchcraft trials. So that's fascinating. And my understanding of witchcraft trials is that a lot of times it seems almost interconnected to your first point about infanticide, that a lot of the witches were also, um, in addition to being different and Mm -hmm. older and maybe creepy ladies or something like that, um, and sometimes even like disabled, you know, like things that are, you know, today we would be incredibly empathetic to, um, they also tended to be like abortionists, right. And, and doing things, um, related to birth or am I, am I totally off on that? Midwives. Uh, and, and, you know, and then I do want to, you know, about, cause you know, well, in fan, while infanticide is a crime, abortion is not. Uh, right. and there's even a question about whether it was even considered a sin, certainly not before quickening, uh, midwives, I think, which of course are doctors in this time period, uh, are often, uh, targeted. And, you know, in some ways a midwife as a doctor is the most powerful position a woman can have in this, in this society. It's, it's certainly the best paid, uh, Anne Hutchinson and Mary Dyer were both midwives. Uh, I would say the big pattern for American people, women who are accused of witchcraft in colonial America specifically, we often assume they're poor. And a lot of times they are poor, uh, but it's more that they're sort of, I think you're on the right track, they're transgressors of some sort. So actually quite a few of them were Quakers uh, or had been accused of Quakerism earlier or some other form of blasphemy. Uh, There are women who had been previously suspected of adultery um, or, you know, in one case, a woman who was a, a tavern owner and the tavern was kind of seen as sort of a seedy place. Um, you know, there, there's a really famous Anne Hibbert uh, in sort of the mid 17th century because she's so unusual. She's basically a magistrate's widow. Uh, she's not poor at all, uh, but she had crossed a whole lot of people uh, and she was seen as, you know, often just contentious. And yeah, you also mentioned uh, mentally ill. Uh, often p- women, you know, if people don't know better, they're scared of people who are talking themselves and, you know, and, and so this, this seems frightening. Uh, so people who seem to be kind of a threat to the community. 
You, you mentioned previously the infanticide case of the twins, which is horrifying. Yeah, it's um, horrifying. <laughs> I know. Are there any like interesting cases of witchcraft? I mean, the Salem witch trial is obviously a big one, yeah. but you know, I know it's wider spread than yeah. that. And that gets a lot of attention in schools. Sure. Uh, well, so in the mid 17th century, uh, you know, there's supposed to be trials for witchcraft. And uh, part of the problem under English law, and, and America was following English law, at least in this one, is it's much harder to prove a witch. Uh, but there was two cases I found in Maryland about mid century, where there was a woman on board the ship, and the ship basically ran into bad weather, and they thought the woman was a witch. And they basically had a drumhead trial for this woman on the spot and then just tossed her overboard. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, you, 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 which is kind of a close to a lynching, honestly. Uh, and, you know, that is not standard. And that, that's how it's sort of more panic than anything else. But, uh, you know, it says something about the level of fear. Uh, that there could be, you know, uh, there was a, a an article that I read that was really interesting. It was sort of a comparison of women. It was called "Will She Hang?" and it was uh, a study of who got what women got executed in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was actually the 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 nineteenth century, eighteen hundred to nineteen hundred, uh, in Pennsylvania and in Virginia. So, sort of, what fe- effect does the presence of race relations have on this equation? Uh, and basically, it was a really complicated pattern because um, you know, in Pennsylvania, it actually over time, white women more more likely to get executed uh, if. Under certain circumstances, infanticide tends to go away, as I said, about the 18th century, because uh, it's seen as a crime, as there has a more sympathetic view of um, of the desperation that women would need to do. You know, they're not seen as monsters. Where what replaces it is basically a woman is likely a white woman is likely in Pennsylvania to hang if she is violating sort of the tenets of motherhood. And so what you're talking about are like poisoners who took out the whole family or women who killed their older children. Uh, you know, there's one woman who for life insurance purposes basically wiped out like, you know, her husband, her son and her infant daughter over a course of months. Like no one's going to notice this one. And, you know, these were the cases. And one of the things is that the story was called Hillary, uh, Hillary Coulson, uh, Will She Hang. Uh, she said, you know, and this kind of you almost can think of, this is out of the time period I usually deal with, but Lizzie Borden, uh, that uh, as the century goes on, of course, and you're probably not surprised to hear this, uh, Black women are treated much more harshly in both places, uh, in Pennsylvania, as well as in Virginia. Uh, in Virginia, before slavery is abolished, they, uh, they're dealt with, with with slave courts for the most part. We often don't have those records. Uh, after uh, the Civil War, they're actually not likely to hang because they're usually wanting them as slave labor in the, in the penitentiaries. Uh, whereas the pattern she found, which I was not expecting, was uh, after the Civil War in Pennsylvania, white women were more likely to hang. And it was because it's sort of like if a woman did violate sort of this idea of a good wife and a good mother, uh, it became a huge scandal in newspapers. And so she actually mentioned one thing, which is, you know, the black women generally, whether they were slave or free, did not get a whole lot of play in the newspaper unless the case was against like a white child. And then they focused on the victims, not on the per- not on the perpetrator. But for the white women, uh, the coverage was intense on the woman. And this is why I brought up Lizzie Borden. Even if they were acquitted, their lives were ruined uh, because uh, because they become infamous uh, because the case. And of course, that's the power of the penny, penny press. Uh, it's funny. Uh, Crime really is never covered by the newspapers until the early 19th century. It was, you know, newspapers are local. You know what's happening in your town. Uh, and so that was not something newspapers ever thought about covering. And it's not really until the penny presses in the early 19th century. And it's just like today. There are certain victims that people want to read about. And the death of a beautiful young white woman or a child, uh, often a girl, uh, several of those cases are, um, you know, are the ones that uh, that actually made the big splash. In fact, actually, I can say one more thing about that, just because I have it on, on my mind, which is uh, I mentioned, you know, a couple of things that people don't realize are not crimes in colonial or even in the early republic. Prostitution is not a crime. Uh, you, know, you get in trouble for having a disorderly house, but that's, you know, you, you, you're just not keeping the peace. Uh, the madam is as likely to call the local constabulacy to uh, get somebody out of her brothel. The other thing is abortion. 
And uh, abortion was not a crime until the late 19th century. And really, you know, it was not something uh, to the extent there was ever any kind of legal action. It is against the abortionist if he was incompetent and killed the woman. It was never about the fetus. Uh, and one of the things that changes that is there is a case in, I believe, New York City in about the early 19th century where they found a young woman, Mary Rogers. They found her body in Hudson Bay. And originally, the reason it was the penny, it was one of the first big cases that the penny press really focused on, uh, because it seemed like it was a gang who had gang raped her. And so this, of course, it was sex. It was violence. Uh, a beautiful young victim. Uh, well, ultimately, nobody, they never, they never solved it, but it seems like it was a botched abortion. That case helps ultimately lead uh, the AMA is formed, uh, the American Medical Association is formed in the mid 19th century, 1840s. Uh, their very first cause is abortion. Uh, they really kind of build their reputation. And it's a way of getting sort of the midwives and what they call the quacks, which often are women, out of medicine and getting the men into medicine. And the issue is uh, abortion. And there was this one woman, uh, her, her sort of trade name was Madame Ristel. And she was extremely wealthy and she was the premier abortionist, probably in the country. And she had all kinds of ads in the New York newspapers. Uh, essentially it's, you know, wink, wink is, uh, if your courses have stopped, if there's, if there's been a problem with your regular courses, um, then you could take the, this elixir and this will help regulate your courses again. Uh, and of course, you know, this is potions and it took them 30 years. A, they hounded her from the 1840s till she finally committed suicide in the 1870s. Uh, but basically going after Estelle and going after abortion uh, is pretty much the main, the first case in which the, the AMA really sort of makes their presence as, as a professional medical organization. I was under the impression that um, a lot of things that we think of as like abortion uh, mm -hmm. were, were legal. So it's interesting. I think um, it's interesting that you talk about this, this sort of shift with the American Medical mm -hmm. Association in 1840. I'm curious, what was, what was abortion? How, like, how was it treated in the colonies? I know you focus on legal history, but you also look at the colonial period a lot. Um, so how, um, how was it treated in that time period? So uh, one of the ways that we can find out about this are sort of like the popular works they were reading, I, you know, all the way back to Aristotle's masterpiece. Whether it's a masterpiece, it's definitely not written by Aristotle. It's basically the premier dirty book. Uh, a lot of people, uh, it, was a data, it was written in the 17th century, but like it's throughout the 18th century. Um, so a few things. First of all, most colonial American women don't seem to be trying to not get pregnant. Uh, they seem to be trying to get pregnant. It's an agricultural world. Uh, children die in, in, in infancy in great numbers. And so you have to have a whole bunch of children uh, to get a few live ones. Uh, the only people who seem to be trying not to get pregnant are prostitutes. And maybe somebody who's committing adultery whose husband is away, so she does not have an alibi. Uh, so for the most part, uh, there isn't a whole lot of focus. But there's certainly, when I did the articles on contraception and abortion, basically what I discovered is nobody's using contraception. I mean, condoms have been around forever, but they don't seem to be in colonial America. The only people who are even remotely thinking, and they're mainly using like IUDs and some really dangerous poisons as douches, are the prostitutes. Um, they're the only ones that are actually seeming to be involved in contraception. Everybody else, if they don't want to be pregnant, has a, does an abortion afterwards. Uh, again, really dangerous. You're mainly talking about drinking a poison and hoping it kills the fetus before it kills you. Uh, so, so really kind of some, some fairly harsh methods. Uh, but, but it's, it's certainly not against the law. And like I said, when they, the only, when the law finally starts, uh, you know, it starts becoming uh, an issue is is the focus for a long time is sort of on the casualties. Uh, and there are a few, like a handful of cases of uh, people going after the abor abortionist because the patient has died. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that, that's sort of, and of course, this also is linked to infanticide, you know, if, if, you know, there is no effective way of stopping the pregnancy. Um, this is why there seems to have been a fairly high rate of infanticide. Another thing I would add with regard to infanticide, you know, there's clearly an obvious economic reason. Of course, there's also a social reason, uh, the huge stigma 
uh, for a lot of people at different levels uh, to have an un, uh, unwanted baby. Now, of course, middle class, upper class women, it's going to affect them, their, their marriage prospects, their social standing. Uh, but across colonial America, something like they said from uh, in the period up to 1776, excluding New England, half the people who come here are coming as servants. Uh, and so servants by law are not allowed to marry. And and pretty much everywhere. So if you're doing an indentured servant, you're not, servitude, you're not allowed to marry. Of course, female servants are incredibly sexually vulnerable. Uh, and there is almost no recourse if they're being raped. There's like, like two cases I found of people trying to sue for rape, unless you are a married woman and it's really the husband suing because his property has been violated. Uh, Women aren't getting any, you know, it, it, it's, it's it, wartime is different, you know, revolution because it's about the British officer, British soldiers. Uh, but generally, there's no recourse. If you get pregnant as a servant, they add two years of time to your indenture. If you say that the master is the reason you're pregnant, the only difference is you don't have to serve with him because they don't want to reward him. You still have, even if you were raped, you still have two years added to your indenture. You just have to serve your indenture somewhere else. Uh, so there is, you know, there is solid reasons why there seem to have been so many, uh, so many infanticides in this time period. Hey, Kelsey, I don't think our listeners know about the new upcoming project that we're working on. Which one? The video series. Oh, the video series. That's awesome. <laughs> I know. So I thought we could tell them a little bit about what the project is, how it's funded, and what the purpose is. Well, we are producing a video series, 25 episodes on U.S. history, 25 episodes on world history. And the point of these is to provide teachers who don't know women's history with like a 10 minute video that they could play for their class. So say you're teaching a lesson on the American Revolution. Here's 10 minutes about women in that time period. Amazing. And it could be a foundation that you can springboard from and do something really cool on those women. And these videos are, yes, you, but they are yeah. fully scripted. You can look at the scripts. They're nicely edited with some really great content. Yep. They're vetted by historians, two PhDs, at least in history. So, you know, people smarter than me. <laughs> But they're going to be free and they're on YouTube. And they'll be on YouTube. They also have a comedian from Hollywood yes. who is helping to make them funny. So it's, you know, because I'm like kind of boring. Uh, no, it's very <laughs> funny. But that's awesome. So they're really engaging and they're really cool content. So more to come there. So we yeah. have those coming out. And those are funded through grants? Through grants, through our patrons. Okay. Um, so their, you know, contributions to us through Patreon are supporting that project and then we also have a lot of people that have been donating through instagram facebook we have a venmo account you can find us there that's awesome um, and they're making those contributions so yeah it's an amazing thing and if this is something that you're like yes that's what teachers need any every penny helps because it is a really expensive project so. it yeah totally and we had a match donor for a while there too yeah. which is really cool so definitely if you're people interested in those yeah feel free to donate. You can donate right on our website, Instagram, and Venmo. Yeah. Which is awesome. Great work. I'm Brooke. excited to see the rest of those videos. Oh, Brooke, thanks for your support of the project. Awesome. You mentioned at the outset that you would tell me about Anne Orthwood's bastard, and I thought this might okay. be a great time to bring that in. Uh, tell me, I don't know anything about Okay. Uh, a book in which the, the person, the, 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 the book is named for, is dead when the book opens. Um, it's funny. I, I structure, when I teach uh, my, my legal history class, I structure it around micro histories. Uh, since I've moved to capital crime, uh, I've kind of not used this book because it's not a capital crime, but it is really interesting. So Anne Orthwood was a servant woman who lived in Virginia. And this is kind of like the middle of the 17th century. Uh, she gave birth to two twins. Uh, you may, I don't know if you know, sort of um, at the moment at which a woman is in labor, her word is like law, because the, the thinking is sort of that old, you have the fear of God before your eyes. Uh, also, the midwives would actually uh, refuse to help until they named the father. It was a form of, I don't want to say torture, but a, a coercion definitely to get the woman. If she has not said who the father of the child is during labor, the midwife will hound it out of them. And once that woman gives that name, it's one of the few times where her word is like, you know, whoever she accuses, they're going to go after that person. Well, she accused the nephew of her master. Uh, she died. 
and she died in childbirth. One of the twins died. The whole book is basically about how does Virginia handle uh, an illegitimate child? Uh, what it, what comes out of it is, as you know, New England's different. New England is far more religious in this time period. But for the South, uh, at least when race issues do not come in, uh, what they're really worried about is not sex, is money. They don't want to take care of the illegitimate child. They don't want them to be a burden on the state. And this seems to have been the, the, the mechanism of who is the father. Okay, we're going to sue him for support of the baby is an easy way of getting these children off the docket. In other words, okay, and she said it's his kid. We're just going to dock him uh, for the amount of money to. And by the way, they also indenture these kids very, very young. Uh, in England, you're not supposed to be able to do an indenture until you're about 17 or 18. We have records in Virginia of them indenturing like they old babies. Uh, so, you know, it's like that. But a kid is not, you're not going to work out a kid until he's at least five. And so somebody has to support that child for at least the first four or five years. And that's really the whole case was turning on who is going to, and of course, the nephew was saying he didn't do it. And, uh, you know, is, is this a legal issue or is this a religious issue? And the sort of the spoiler is sort of what Virginia really doesn't care whether he slept with her or not. Uh, what they want is they want their check. Uh, they want somebody to take care of this child for the first five years. Uh, and then it also got into sort of what was the status of somebody who was born the illegitimate child of an indentured servant, like what happened to this young man as he grew up. What did happen to him? What what is what is that like to be labeled bastard? Well, it, it's not great, but it, since we're talking about the South, it, the race line definitely matters. Uh, you know, so he, as I recall, uh, he, he lived to adulthood. I don't think he lived much past it. Uh, you can certainly get past. I mean, <laughs> Alexander Hamilton did it. Uh, have illegitimate and 17th century Virginia. I mean, one of the, uh, you know, things that's often said in 17th century Chesapeake generally is that they were having a lot of sort of social problems because there isn't a whole lot of difference between the rich and the poor. Uh, you know, a lot of people are only one or two generations removed from being servants themselves. And this is why you have so many slander cases, so many people insulting magistrates and, you know, back talking to judges. It's a constant problem in the Chesapeake. They seem to have a lot more problems with that, mm -hmm. including with some women. Uh, but, uh, but one thing that's really interesting, if you look at the South with regard to bastardy, and I've certainly, this is not, I tend to work up in New England and Pennsylvania. It's definitely not my area, but uh, interracial bastards is a major way that the, the racial line is created uh, because it's created basically on the backs of white women. Uh, of white servants. Uh, and this happened sort of over the course of 17th, but really the 18th century. Uh, if you are a white woman, and uh, first of all, interracial marriages are forbidden pretty much by the dawn of the 18th century. Uh, you know, I think Virginia, 1691, you know, North Carolina, which is a slightly younger colony. It's in the early 18th century, South Carolina, same thing. So you can't get married across the race line. So now we're talking about you know, illicit your interracial relationships. If you are a, a black woman and you have a mixed race child, that basically is not a problem. Uh, that's sort of, and of course, because the status of slavery follows the mother, those children disappear. They just basically disappear into slavery. Uh, however, if you are a white woman, whether you are free or a servant, if your child is born and is mixed race, First of all, you, even if you're free, you can have two years added, added to your indenture. Also, we're talking whippings, public shamings, just sort of uh, an awful lot of you know, sort of social burdens being placed on, on white women who are giving birth to mixed-race children. And then this was North Carolina specifically. I was reading about the mixed-race child gets a 31-year indenture. And they're not free. These are free kids. Uh, they are indentured for 31 years, which is like the longest indenture I've ever seen. Uh, and it is essentially trying to, because, of course, at the bottom, servants and slaves, there was an awful lot of intermingling in the early period. And they're, they're trying to stop that. Uh, as I said, basically, one side of it becomes invisible. Uh, but the other side is sort of where where the where the barrier is being put. Yeah. 31 years. I mean, life expectancy is like 40, right? It's so not great in the Chesapeake. I mean, New England lives almost as long as we do, but the Chesapeake is not a healthy place. So yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the longest indenture I've ever seen. I was like, whoa. Oh, and only because this child was interracial. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, it, and uh, I and I'm, I'm blanking on the historian who 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 was doing this the study. I, I'll 
come along with it. Um, but uh, it basically, it also sometimes would happen uh, to free black women uh, if they gave birth to illegitimate children, their children were also put in this really long indenture if they seemed like they were going to be a burden on the state. Uh, and, you know, this is, you know, if you add this together with the increase, the decreasing, uh, the increasing difficulty of manumission, uh, the fact like in Virginia by the 18th century, if you're free, you have six months to get out of the state. Um, all of this is basically trying to dwindle away the free black population. Right. <laughs> so, so we've talked about um, infanticide. We've talked about witches. We mm -hmm. talked about the way that you know the court systems deal with illegitimate children. Mm -hmm. So, I'm curious um, about other ways in which women interacted with the law in this early period of American history. How? What? what are there other major themes that you've noticed? Let's talk about scolds and slanders, which which uh, is is a huge thing everywhere. Um, and difference is basically a scold is just a cranky woman, you know, just sort of. Uh, it, this is a specifically gendered. Men are never men. Can, certainly, slander is gender neutral. You know, this is an age in which people's reputations are incredibly important. Uh, women and men can be slanderers equally. Uh, slander is verbal. Libel is written. Uh, but scold seems to be uniquely female. And has a uniquely female punishment, which is the dunking booth. Uh, it's actually not a witchcraft thing. I, you know, it is not here anyway. Uh, and it's not meant to be lethal. I'm sure it's miserably uncomfortable. Essentially, what you're doing is tying a woman uh, either to a chair or to a plank and then dunking them. Uh, you know, not holding them down so long they've drowned, but it's just sort of like waterboarding somebody. Uh, and, you know, the, the point is, is somebody who is, like I said, scold is very specifically female and, it, and the punishment for it is very specifically female. Uh, there's two other ones that are huge, especially in 17th century America. They are not necessarily meant to be female crimes, in fact, as one historian said, one of them has to have men and women in it the way they conceive of it, but the way they're treated, and that is fornication and adultery, which are huge across the dockets everywhere. Uh, as I said, most servants can't marry, and so wherever you have a large uh, servant population, you're going to have lots of fornication. Uh, adultery is only defined by the woman's marital status, not the man's. So, And adultery is a capital crime. Uh, fornication is usually punished by a fine or whipping. And of course, the line here is whether you have the money, uh, you know, the, 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 the pe wealthier people get fined, the poor people get, get whipped, uh, which of course is very humiliating in addition to being very painful. It's because a woman, you're being, you're stripped, being stripped to, um, stripped to the waist. Uh, and they, I found, I forgot where it was, one case where they deliberately said, because she was a notorious, um, you know, ill liver, uh, that you're going to, turn her so she faces the audience when you strip her before you turn her back to tie her towards the car. In other words, everybody's going to see, uh, see her breasts, uh, but both, you know, make sure that she's good and humiliated before you do this. Um, but adultery was not meant, it was meant to be sort of gender inclusive. And again, this is specifically heterosexual. So there's one of each, but it's so often revealed because of a pregnancy. And so across colonial America, you have more women. Uh, it's only three women in the early days were hang actually hanged for adultery. I and mean, they were hanged with their lovers. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, we're talking about uh, whippings. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, fornication, uh, again, uh, you know, it's, it should be both, but because women get pregnant, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to get revealed in a way that men, you know, men do not. Um, I only know this from Hester Prynne in yeah. uh, the Scarlet Letter, but she doesn't give up. And this is a fictional story oh, yeah. written in the you know 1800s, but um, she doesn't give up her lover at the end of that to protect him from the same thing, right? Well, it, it, yeah, and yes, absolutely. And uh, of course, I think that story says more about Hawthorne, who was actually descended from a Salem witch judge and changed his last name because he was ashamed of it. Uh, he changes the spelling of Hawthorne because he is directly descended from one of the Salem. He's got some issues with his Puritan heritage. Uh, but one of the things I did learn is that really did happen. I mean, not the print story specifically, but putting letters on, on women's clothing. Uh, with men as well. Uh, the Puritans in particular were very big on public shaming, which again, seems really kind of 
cruel and horrible to us, but it to them was a way of reincorporating people within the community. You know, they, they, they repent. Uh, so often if you uh, were sort of uh, low level fornication, which is generally the people who got married and six months later, here's the baby. Uh, the baby showed up a little too early. Uh, one very common penalty was they had to, for several church services, dress all in white robes and stand there with a wand. Why, why? I don't know what kind of symbolism that's supposed to be. Uh, placards around the neck. Uh, in addition to A for adulterer, you could have T for thief, um, you know, uh, and yeah, no, I actually did. I was surprised to find that, you know, I'm, but of course, Hawthorne knew this. I mean, he comes from this culture. He'd heard those stories uh, that there were cases where, you know, a woman has been condemned to uh, wear an A and she has to wear it on every single piece of clothing. And if she's ever found not wearing it, she will be whipped. And hmm. there were at least a handful of cases uh, where where that was the penalty. Hmm. That's fascinating. I am just, it's so funny when you were talking about the consequences for these women that were like specifically designed for them, right? As we, yeah. like, yeah. we're going to waterboard you because you're a woman. I'm like, what? That's a really like, that's not, that, kind of the antithesis of ladylike treatment. You know, <laughs> you'd think like a little hand slap would be more, more ladylike or something. Um, and then the whippings and, and the intentional shaming them specifically as a woman, right? We're going we're gonna to expose your breasts. This seems really harsh, um, but I guess that's colonial society. 17th century is very different from 18th century. The 17th century... Uh, their view of women, uh, which of course also fed into the witchcraft, is that women are earthier than men. They actually have stronger sex drives than men. This is one of the major, I mean, there's a huge debate, of course, about why are all witches female? Uh, and, you know, one is, of course, you know, this society and European society, for that matter, are pretty much heteronormative <laughs> across the board. And so they conceive of both God and the devil as men. And so, of course, who's the devil going to want to seduce? It's not going to go for men. It's going to go for women. But they believed that, you know, women, so, so they, since they were earthier and sort of more fleshy and more lusty, uh, they were actually more prone to a lot of uh, to, to weaknesses. Whereas the 18th century does tend to have a much more sort of sentimental view of women. It's this sort of, as you're getting closer to the revolution, uh, again, you know, if a woman has been led astray, just that language itself, led astray, uh, this is sort of where you're starting to get the romantic novels, first romantic novels come in that always feature sort of the poor little innocent woman who leaves her village and goes to the big evil town and then she meets a rogue uh you know she meets meets a scoundrel uh who basically fools her and deludes her uh and leads her astray and so there, there tends to be a lot more sympathetic uh I, I, there was i i try to think there was one case um if I can think about it, I'm, I'm, my mind's on infanticide, obviously, but it is, it does tend to be, uh, it's, it's not only one of the big things that they were, uh, accused of. It's also something that often would kind of capture people's attention. Uh, I'm trying to think of, it was a case kind of in the mid, oh, here she is. Uh, actually, it was an infanticide case. Uh, it was in Pennsylvania, Charlotte Jones in 1857. Uh, along with, it was a, kind of an egregious case. And again, once you get into the 19th century, you've got the newspapers. Uh, and they have figured out crime sells. Uh, so along with her lover, uh, Charlotte murdered an elderly brother and sister for their money. Charlotte was their niece. And they basically, you know, broke into uh, their, their their kind of isolated house and rather brutally murdered them. And when the newspapers first started talking about the case, Charlotte's a monster. And they actually, in this is a Pennsylvania case, uh, kind of kind of hint that she might be non-white or part non-white. So they talk about her having an Indian cast. They also talk about her looking large and mannish. Uh, she's not, you know, she's not a traditional woman, you know, she, she's kind of, and she's sexually promiscuous and she, she's sleeping with two different men, uh, who all, who were both involved. There's an unindicted co-conspirator, a third man who didn't get hanged. Um, but then the case, it's like the way they covered it as they went on, um, the, it, they shift. And, uh, by the end of it, I mean, she still ended up getting executed. Uh, but the mood of the newspaper was talking about her as a poor seduced victim. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there actually, towards the end, was an unsuccessful attempt to commute her sentence because they, they, clearly the villains here were the two men who had led her astray. 
That's incredible. Um, this poor, <laughs> these poor, men, I want to go back and like give them a time machine and be like, come to the 21st century. It's much more lovely, sort of. Um, <laughs> well, these ca- in some of these cases, you know, they, they, they could still end up, uh, uh, but on the other hand, you know, it's funny, you know, like this, I've kind of gone back to this article, will she hang, which I thought was kind of fun, you know, which ones would hang, which ones wouldn't. Uh, in 1844, there was a lady in Philadelphia, Sarah Ann Davis, uh, and she had slit the throat of a romantic rival. She cut her throat, basically, you know, in a fight. Uh, and again, huge, this is the kind of case that gets huge press coverage, but the press coverage, she was, she was actually sentenced to death, but commuted. Uh, the press coverage was rather largely sympathetic because it was a romantic triangle. Uh, the blame actually was on, again, on the husband. Uh, he had two women. He kept the, you know, they, they, he basically had a bit on the side and neither of them knew about the other. And so he was ultimately to blame for this whole thing going down. Wow. So, yeah, I think the pattern uh, often is, you know, the ones that are just like throw away the key, you know, hanger, no sympathy often are uh, the ones that are going against children or going against their families and uh, seem sort of outside of the realm of, you know, sort of the way women are seen as supposed to behave. That's fascinating. I know that um, there's a lot of women who... Uh, poor women, single women who live together to support one another. Um, are there any trials that you encountered related to like homosexuality or? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Okay, so so there's uh, first of all, our laws based on homosexuality are based on English law, which does not know that lesbians exist. It goes all the way back to Elizabethan times. Uh, it's always. First of all, homosexual, male homosexuality, uh, which I said really has only gotten really studied in early American, like the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, if you look at just this, is a very good example of the problem, the older legal way of doing history, just looking at the court cases, if you look at the older, especially for New England, it looks like we are just hang them high land, uh, you know, incredibly brutal. And not just in New England, uh, the Netherlands, like, you know, the penalty in New Netherlands for homosexual behavior was that old sort of Roman thing about, you know, tying them into a sack with a fox and a snake and all and then throwing it in the river. You know, it, it's just really draconian. But if you actually look at what's actually what actually happens, there are very, very few people who actually execute it. It requires penetration and two witnesses. Now, that's not as completely unbelievable because this is such a face-to-face world that people are living on top of one another, uh, but it's still a kind of a high bar of, uh, you know, high bar of, of proof. Uh, you know, they have to prove that penetration and ejaculation actually occurred. Now, how does the bystander prove this? Uh, and there needs to be two witnesses. So you're really a handful of male cases and so I, you know, basically the, what I found was there's like two really early on in like mid 17th century. And of course, both up in New England of two sets of women, they're accused of lewd behavior with one another and they're whipped. This seems to have been lesbian conduct, but at least in one case, especially in the 17th century, there is a connection in the Puritan mind between uh, sexual misbehavior and religious uh, in fact, the word buggery actually comes from an old phrase from heresy. Uh, and so at least one of these women also was stopping her ears in church. Uh, and another one might have blasphemed. And so it's sort of, you know, the 17th century generally tends to lump all these things together as kind of, you know, uh, dissolute behavior, uh, ungodly behavior generally. Uh, but I could also talk about Thomas Thomasine Hall. Have you uh, heard of, I guess, them would be the appropriate, of course, Thomasine is not around to ask, you know, are you a he? Are you a her? Are you a them? Actually, we do have an answer. Uh, Thomasine Thomas said, I am both. Uh, so this is one of the only cases of where we could absolutely say without a doubt intersex uh, in colonial America. Born Thomasine Hall over in England, identified as female, moved to Virginia, and then seems to have gone back and forth throughout their life, uh, mostly for economic reasons, it seems like. So when war's going on, pays better to be a soldier. When it's peacetime, pays better to be a prostitute. Uh, was eventually brought in front of the court for fraud, for, for deceit, uh, because, you know, he is presenting as a she, but he has male parts. And so they actually stripped I'm just going to go with Thomasine here, uh, stripped them. And uh, and then the court gave their ruling. The ruling was, yeah, 
they say they're both and they're both. Uh, and so um, the court's ruling, it wasn't like a flogging or anything. They seem to have ordered Thomasine to wear the clothing of both both parties. Uh, so dressed like a man, but with an apron, with a hat and an apron on over. And of course, it, you know, most modern historians see this as a punishment, as shaming. Uh, you also could argue they're taking Thomasine at their word. You know, they say they're both. So <laughs> you're, you're dressed as both. But it was interesting because, again, Virginia is, is very fixated on economic stuff. And it was, it was almost like, this is fraud. You know, if you're presenting as a female prostitute, but you're not a female prostitute, your clients aren't getting their money's worth. Um, Thomasine seemed to be having both male and female uh, clients. Hmm. Uh, but uh, it's a very interesting case because there is so little evidence of uh, that sort of thing in early America. Even in legal history, it shows up. We have quite a few cross-dressers, but we do not know and we can't know whether it wasn't just for economic purposes. Uh, I'm looking in my notes. Uh, often it's somebody serving in the military, uh, serving as a sailor, serving as a soldier. Uh, you certainly also do just have a few cases which are not, don't show up in criminal records. Uh, at the end of the life, somebody dies and they discover this man and wife is actually a woman living with another woman. And that certainly does happen occasionally. Um, but where it is sort of popped up uh, in, in the records, sort of in the legal records, is when somebody was uncovered. Uh, there was actually a case. Um, Deborah Sampson is the most famous case in the Revolutionary War um, because she actually got a, a pension. Uh, she served as a man throughout the Revolutionary War. And, you know, and then after the war, when she was poor and old, uh, she sued for her pension and her superior officers testified. Yes, she we found out later when she was wounded. She was a woman. She continued to serve. Uh, she served well. And yes, she's deserving of her pension. Uh, but there was also another woman who was found out in a New Jersey regiment and she was publicly shamed. They basically played the whores march uh, to drum her out of the army. And again, the thinking seems to be here that the real that a woman would put on a man's outfit is because she's a prostitute and she's looking for clients. She's trying to have greater access to her. that. That seems to have been the mentality. There's so there's so much in, in what you've just talked about. I, you know, like the way in which gender is seen as like so strictly and enforceably binary. And um, I did some research on Elizabeth uh, on crossdressers in Elizabeth mm -hmm. England and um I got to read, you know, these newspaper articles from that time period at the Library of London. And I, I was mind blown by um, similar themes to what you're talking about in American history, just yeah. the, the way that they were perceived as prostitutes and and how it was it was that and there were no other options. And today yeah. we can be like, th there are a million other reasons why people might do that, you know, like. <laughs> Um, economic, be, being in love with a person that you can't see. And so, you you know, and, you know, anything that's outside of marriage is, is prostitution, <laughs> you know, like alert, alert. Um, so it's pretty, that's pretty wild. Well, thank you so much for oh, sharing absolutely. all of this incredible history with me and, and our audience. I am mind blown by just the the way the, how much we can know and understand about society just looking at it from a legal perspective. Well, I, I, wa I wanted to name drop my colleague uh, if you were looking for um, like references, uh, Sarah Damiano, uh, who is a fellow early Americanist at Texas State, has actually put together. Um, I am trying to remember. I, 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 I probably Google it and find her, uh, but she basically made a list of women specifically in legal history, like a sort of a, a, a bibliography of place if you're trying to get started uh, finding. It was actually very helpful to me in prepping for this. Uh, so, uh, so I just wanted to mention her name uh, as, as somebody. If, you're, if people are trying to find like some books on this sort of topic, uh, it's like basically, basically like an online. I, I think it's for Oxford bibliographies or something like that. That's amazing. Um, that's awesome. Sarah Damiano. And yes. that's amazing. Texas State. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Um, I guess my last question to you um, is about where you see this history fitting in sort of a traditional survey class of the United States and early colonial period. Um, 
do you, would you just plop it in there chronologically as you're talking about cultural yeah. development? How would you do it if you're a There's always women. I mean, we're, we're all over the place. Um, we show up all over the place. Uh, it, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, the, the kind, it's a, really, it's kind of the kinds of records you use. Uh, and this is where, you know, like I said, if you are if you're sticking strictly to, to political history, there's really before a certain point, it's very hard to insert women in those records. Uh, they just aren't showing up. Uh, if you sort of go more into, I mean, I, I'm talking about legal history here, but what I've actually myself been doing for the last couple of years in the survey since Corona started is I've gotten into history disease. Uh, infectious disease specifically. And so that's actually been my theme in my survey. And again, that's a place where uh, you end up with a lot of you talking about people who don't normally show up in the records. And, you know, honestly, before the 18th century, women were in ch charge of the medical system. I, you know, it, 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 the story of medicine is really a story of the men shoving the women out of the way uh, is really what happens when you're talking about the professionalization of the medical industry. Hmm. That's amazing. We've talked about that in other episodes on our podcast, the tradition, you know, the history of, of childbirth and things like that and how it's shifted. Um, so folks can find those episodes um, as well, because it speaks to everything that you've been talking about. Um, one, one thing that I've used in my actually used in my class, especially in my upper level class, is a midwife's tale, uh, the film, uh, which is kind of, you know, Laura Ulrich Thatcher's uh, the book. The film is kind of the making of the book, which I really like. Uh, it really it's great for a number of things. One, it shows a midwife is not just childbirth. I mean, she is the doctor for her community. Uh, it also shows for a lot of ordinary Americans, she lives smack dab in the middle of the revolution. It's like she could care less. Like how little uh, a, lot, a lot of the political stuff, if you're out on the frontier, uh, the revolution doesn't play a huge, it, it plays a little bit of what, because her husband was a loyalist. So he got in a little bit of trouble for that. Uh, but for the most part, those really big issues are not playing a big role in her day-to-day -day life. And the other thing that I really like about it, it just sort of shows just how much work, uh, you know, women, men, but just everybody is doing like every single day, you know, the, the amount of just strenuous labor uh, that, uh, that it just takes to get through the day. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Um, people should definitely use that in their classes. That's awesome. Yeah. It's actually, a, it's a great resource for early America to sort of get a feeling like there's this one scene where everybody's getting dressed at the same time. And first of all, they all need to help one another into their clothes. And secondly, they have to put the furniture up before they have room to move around. Uh, and it just sort of shows like the kind of just constant labor that it takes just to keep a colonial house, household going. Yeah, seriously. I think people underestimate when we talk about there's so much like anti domestic labor vibes in feminism today. And, you know, we, we've sort of lost how hard domestic labor really is and the appreciation for that. Um, wow. There's almost no single people in colonial America because it takes multiple people to keep the household going. I really, it, it, you know, women's work is it, it crucially necessary. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Really? I also wanted to ask you lastly, as yeah. you in your job, you also work with people going off to eventually become <laughs> teachers. Yeah. And um, you and I are both in states. You're in Texas. I'm here in New Hampshire where there's been a lot of really fascinating things going on in our legal system mm -hmm. about education. And um I'm curious what your experience has been and what, you know, what advice you would give to practicing and budding teachers out there. I mean, I, I teach the teachers. I teach a lot of people who are teaching AP history. Uh, yeah, I teach at the high school level. I also grade for AP US. So I meet a lot of the high school teachers. I've been doing that for about a decade. Um, you know, I think the best thing we can do is just teach the teachers. I, you know, I am frustrated, as we talked about before, that there just seems to be this wall between K through 12 and college. And it's not just about race and gender. It's even something as basic as like the, um, you know, the Boston Massacre, uh, you know, and we've known for you know, generations now uh, that it's not, you know, poor, innocent Americans standing there and being killed by the brutal Brits. And yet 
every generation, my freshmen, when I come in and I ask them, that is still what they're being, it's like they're still being taught by the 1950s. Uh, it can get very frustrating. It's like, are, you know, are we making no impact whatsoever here? Um, so, you know, the, I, I, aside from, I don't know what to do about the politics, but, you know, doing, you know, making sure that the people who are going in to teach at the high school level have the resources, you know, they know how to keep up with their fields, uh, you know, and so they are introducing the, the latest research to their classes. That's really the only thing I can think of to do. Yeah. I would also say paid to keep up with their fields, right? Sometimes that's that's a lost element in public school teachers' lives um, to have paid covered professional development so that they can oh, yeah. continue their educations. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and your energy. This is such an asset to the conversation. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, it was nice talking with you. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.